Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Josh Barrow. I'm a senior editor at Business Insider, um, and we're here to talk about the new tax law and what it is going to mean uh, for our future, for the economy, uh, GDP growth, wage growth, business investment, and also what it's going to mean uh, for our fiscal future as we face trillion dollar plus uh, government budget deficits uh, for a significant period. Um, and we have a, a really great panel to discuss that. Um, Eric Cantor is with us. He's the former House Majority Leader, as you surely know. He's now the Vice Chairman and Managing Director at MOLIS. Uh, Jason Furman, professor of practice at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He also led the chairman, he, or he was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Obama. Uh, Bill Lee is the uh, chief economist uh, with Milken Institute, formerly with Citi. Um, and Maya McGinnis uh, is president of the Committee uh, for a Responsible Federal Budget, which is an anti deficit uh, policy nonprofit in Washington. So I, we'll, we'll take questions from the audience near the end of this discussion. I want to lay out sort of three big topics uh, for us to discuss amongst ourselves on, on this panel here. Um, the first is big effects on the economy. Uh, yesterday we had Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin on stage in the Wilshire Ballroom uh, saying that he thinks the tax cuts are going to drive so much growth that they will pay for themselves. Um, that strikes me as a little bit irrationally exuberant, um, but uh, I want to hear our panel discuss um, how they think uh, the tax cuts are going to affect business investment, hiring, wages, and what that's going to mean for the broader economy and for GDP. Um, the second issue I want to talk about is what we might call leakage, uh, which is provisions of the bill and whether they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. A lot of the coverage in the last few days um, has focused around uh, stock buybacks, uh, this question of whether the tax cuts are now fostering more returns of capital to investors than new corporate investment. Is that something we should worry about? That's also something Mnuchin talked about saying, you know, well, that, you know, the, that money doesn't go away. It ends up with the investors, and then it can go get invested in another business. Um, there's also questions around the provisions on territoriality and pass-through companies um, and how those are going to work out in terms of, you know, what, who is going to get what tax cuts from those and what uh, tax avoidance they may spur. Uh, and then the third thing I want to talk about is the fiscal picture. Um, which is that, you know, to the extent that tax cuts do not pay for themselves, what do they mean in the long run for fiscal policy? A, a large part of this law is temporary. Um, Republicans have made clear their desire to make the entire law permanent. Um, is that going to be a thing that is possible to do over the next few years? Um, and what are we going to need to do in terms of either new revenue sources or spending cuts um, in order to bring that fiscal picture into line in the long run and to make this bill uh, sustainable? Uh, so, uh, with a table set like that, um, I, I, I think it's generally good to start with the affirmative case. So, uh, Eric, why don't, why don't you oh, talk thought, about... Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what, what's, 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 the, like, what's great about this law? And, and is Mnuchin right? Is this gonna, are these going to pay for themselves? You know, I'm, I'm honored to be here and to be able to preempt Jason. So Good, um, yes. Uh, no, but listen, I, I generally align myself uh, with the Secretary because I think all of us know that these tax cuts on, on the corporate side especially, and the business side especially, are extremely accretive to any business now. I mean, we, we are seeing significant dollars flow to the bottom line. Uh, and so, yes, I, I do think that this bill, uh, I think all of us agree, even the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office says, that we can expect a 0.7 increase in uh, GDP because of this in terms of growth. Uh, they project about a 560 some trillion dollar uh, deficit reduction um, on, on top of the cost of about a, a trillion and a half. So again, that's their estimate. I think all of us are guessing. I think the secretary, I think you know, Jason, this learned individual next to me, will tell you uh, probably uh, about the, the um, uh, mitigating aspects or, or what, what the problems are. But I think all of us agree that it is a positive uh, in terms of business growth. And, you know, you, you talked about uh, just the, the, uh, the positive aspects. If you look at the bill, there's a tremendous incentive uh, for CapEx in this bill. Uh, and when you're talking about increased incentive for business to deploy capital, you're talking about hopefully increasing in, in productivity. Once we increase productivity, there's increase in wages. Uh, and um, we'll see the, um, that, the, that increased value turn over into somewhere else in our economy. So there, there are all kinds of things, I think, that point to the positive in this bill. And lastly, when you look at the eight years of the prior administration and what we've gone through in terms of sub-2% growth, the fact that we are now looking at and even discussing 3% possibility of growth has to be a positive thing. So, Bill, uh, 
I, I know you have some slides on this. Um, to, so the, the story that, that Eric tells basically about, you know, this, this encourages business investments. You're going to see that flow through in productivity. And in the long run, hopefully, you see it flow through in wages. What should we be watching for there to try to figure out the size of those effects? Thanks, Josh. And, and, yeah. and let me say that um, you know, I, most of my life has been in the Fed, the IMF. So I've been working in policy circles a lot. And when policymakers make these promises, right, as economists, we have to say, well, where are the data to back this up? And so if you pull up slide number two, let's look at the investment picture first um, you know Eric is right to say that investment has become uh, has grown at the slowest pace in post World War II history you see the bars on the left there almost almost decade by decade and almost year by year you see the pace of investment slowing down and if you look at the right hand picture where you see investment really shooting up recently has mainly been in oil related sectors the, as oil prices have gone up we find more drilling but non oil investment really has been quite damped and, and, and quite quite moderate. So if you go to slide number three, the, the, the data backing up what, what Eric just said about productivity is right there. We have the slowest pace of productivity in post-World War II history as well. And you see the, the, the quarterly numbers on the right, you show that there's been a, a little bit of a rebound in the last year or so. Um, but, but, but essentially, whether that is sustainable or not depends upon the degree of investment and also technology. And I'm gonna make the case that, that in fact, one of the great things about this tax bill is not talked about very much, which are the incentive effects. I, I'm not going to put myself on the cross and say that the tax bill is going to spur so much investment, we're going to get to 3% growth. In fact, it's very hard to find any macro model that will get you that result. And, and, and as someone who's played with macro models his entire life, I can assure you it's very hard to get investment to push GDP growth to those levels. But what, one thing that is important is this notion of long-run productivity growth. That has been one of the reasons why that pro one of the reasons why productivity growth has slowed so much is because we have underinvested, and that explains about half of that, but the other half is because technological progress seems to be slowing down. And if you flip this to the next chart, uh, chart number four, one of the reasons behind that has to do with financing. And, and this is something that you don't hear about a lot, which is that say that the red line you see uh, on the upper part of the chart, the share of debt, corporate debt to GDP is the highest ever in, in, in post-World War II history. So corporates over the last 10 years or more have started to leverage up. And, and if you remember the, um, the, the, back in the 80s, a Harvard professor by the name of Jensen said, I have a theory of push management back to the wall, right? Load them up with so much debt, they have to be efficient or else they're gonna go bust. Well, one of the implications that, that I've discovered in the research I've done here, as well as at Citi, uh, if you go to slide number six, that's it, is that there's actually a negative relationship between debt intensity, that is debt as a share of GDP in the corporate sector and productivity. And, and, and why is that? The reason for that is, and the, if you flip back to chart number five, Sorry guys, I got out of order. You notice that investment over the last several years has changed its composition. It's gone from machines and buildings and structures to that dark blue line on the, on, on the bottom there, which is intellectual property and computers. That's, that has grown all through the 70s and 80s as a share of GDP and now has flatlined as we've seen more and more corporate debt. So, and, and go, go to the next one again, go to back to chart six. Why is it that we see th that link between productivity and, and, um, and, and debt? It's because when you load up a company with debt, as I said, managers have to be concerned about paying off that debt. So what kind of investment are they going to go for? They're going to go for tangibles, right? They're going to they're go for stuff that bondholders are going to say, I want, if you go bust, I want to be able to sell off your stuff. And if it's a tangible asset, I can have a better chance of selling off. If you invest in human capital, training your staff, non-tangibles, that stuff walks out the door every night. Right. So and, and so the, the, the firms are less incentivized to, to, to invest in, in, in non tangibles. The other thing they're not incentivized to do is incentivize. They're not incentivized to take long term bets. The, the, the incremental investments they're making with a lot of debt is they got to be sure these investments pay off. So the, the kind of investments they do, they do are very conservative, sure to pay off. And those are the kind of investments that don't lead to a lot of productivity growth. And you saw earlier, the share of computer intellectual property as a share of GDP has flatlined because we are underinvesting in that. And that's the source of the next boost in technological progress. So, so one of the things, my main message is that 
one of the positive aspects of tax reform that hasn't been talked about is not so much that it's going to boost GDP growth in and of itself because of expenditures, but it's going, it, it has the possibility of changing the composition of investment to lead to longer run increases in productivity, more productive investment that lead to higher wages and, 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 and more employment of human capital complementary labor. Right, right now, one of the, the concerns we have about job growth is that automation and technological progress is replacing people. But what the, the, the change in the composition investment could do is to say, if we train people and give them the right set of skills, they will be complementary to the kind of, 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 of investments and, and capital equipment that we're going to be putting in place. So, so that's the short, uh, that not so short answer to, 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 um, to putting some, some numbers and, 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 and possibilities behind the kind of promises that the policymakers really want to, to, to put out there. So when you say longer run, that this is, you know, as you get, you know, either, you know, lower tax rates encourages corporations to invest overall, or this change, you know, limiting interest deductibility changes the capital structure, encourages them to invest different and better. How long do we have to wait to figure out uh, whether that's worked and how large the effect is? If I had finished my paper, you'd have the answer right now. But, uh, <laughs> but, but clearly these are multi-year, multi-year uh, processes. And, and, and I know that, uh, one, one of the things about, about productivity is that it's very hard to predict. That is, when do you know you're going to get a, a, a new Facebook? When is it you're going to get a new Amazon, right? Those are, those are things that, you know, Jeff Bezos has been losing money hand over fist for the longest time until Amazon really started to, to develop into the, the big massive engine that it is now. So, so these are clearly multi-year and possibly multi-decade, which means that you have to sustain these incentives over time. If, if we have a, a kind of a, a, a stop-go kind of policy where you remove these incentives and put them back on because of concerns about sustainability of the deficit and everything else, that will certainly foreshorten the, the possibility of this coming, coming true. Yeah, so, so Jason, to, to, to Eric's point, Basically, all of the models and estimates I've seen on, on this bill, they have, they have different you know, ranges of estimates in terms of what the effect on the economy will be. But I think every estimate I've seen has a plus sign over the next 10 years. So you, you share the sentiment, I take it, that this will cause the um, economy to grow compared to I doing nothing? I think there is a actually large degree of unanimity in the economic analysis of the tax bill. You know, there's all these like two-handed economists, no one ever agrees, you turn on CNBC, everyone arguing type of stuff. Um, but the people who have actually done serious modeling and rigorous work around this tend to come up with pretty similar answers. In the short run, you know, we're going to get a fiscal stimulus. If you have a $200 billion anything, I don't care what it is, you're going to get an impetus for aggregate demand. Um, I don't think anyone thinks that's what the economy particularly needed. And insofar as we did need it, we could have gotten it just by the Fed raising rates more slowly. So this isn't, I don't think anyone has an aggregate demand theory for this. The real questions are the ones that um, Bill was identifying, which is what will this do to aggregate supply? What will it do to expand investment, which we need for productivity growth? About half of the slowdown in productivity growth we've had is because of a slowdown in business investment. The other half is because of less total factor productivity, which is a measure of innovation. And you know we have policy levers um, for that business investment. So the question is, what will this um, do to it? A lot of different models have asked that question. And they've all come up with the answer that after about a decade, the economy would be about 1 half of 1% larger than it otherwise would have been because of this. If you translate that into growth rates, that's half of a tenth a year on the growth rate. And so if the growth rate would have been 2.0. It would now be sort of still around to 2.0. And the reason they've come up with that um, number is based on looking at what investment opportunities before were not profitable at the tax rates before but now at a lower tax rate, all of a sudden, it's worth your doing. You sort of draw a list of investments. Here's the ones you're definitely going to do. Here's the ones you're not going to do. Which ones are drawn in in the middle? Um, and there's a bit fewer than you'd think. And the reason there's fewer than you'd think is because the tax system before had a lot of things that were reducing um, the cost of taxes. Uh, there was a lot of different ways to avoid taxes before. And so taxes, you know, the headline rate was 35. That wasn't the real underlying economic reality. 
Conversely, under this bill, we lowered it to 21, but then we did some things like um, where every economist agrees on something like net operating losses, that you should be able to carry them back, get that back on your taxes if you make a loss, and this bill takes that away, um, the ability to carry it back, which is actually a disincentive to engage in more risky investment of a type um, that, that, that um, unanimously would suggest was wrong. And you take all of this together, and it turns out to be pretty complicated. On um, equipment, the marginal tax rate goes down, effective marginal rate, and then as expensing gets phased out, it goes back up again. Structures, the tax rate goes down. We're definitely going to get more structures because of this bill. The scary thing, and, and looking at bills, this is particularly scary, the marginal tax rate on R&D goes up as a result of this legislation. It will now be more expensive to undertake R&D than it was before it. Um, that's for two reasons. One is um, an interaction with rate lowering in a world where interest is partly deductible. And the second is that um, you, businesses get to expense their R&D. Starting in 2022, they'll have to amortize it, depreciate it over five years. So it'll be effectively a tax penalty on it. So you go through each one of these and you get a subtle, um, complicated story. I agree with Bill that, by the way, lowering, I'm sorry, raising Reducing the differential between debt and equity is a good thing. Our tax system before had huge preference for debt financed investment. That actually reverses and there's a little bit more of a preference for equity financed investment over debt. I think that's a good thing um, and will be a positive. So I guess my, my bottom line to you, Josh, is yeah, I think most of the estimates are a positive, but this is you know, spending one to two and a half trillion dollars depending on what gets extended, what gets paid for it. Could you have spent one to two and a half trillion and gotten an even larger positive would be point one. Um, point two is almost all of the models that generate this positive assume that the tax cut will eventually be paid for. So you only get that half a point after a decade if you actually pay for it. The one model that took seriously at not being paid for was the IMF, um, and they're the one model that found it would be a negative after a decade because of what it would do to our debt. Um, and if you now want to go to our, our last panelist. Yes, that, 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 that's uh, Not to take your job. No, no, no. So, I mean, so, I, I mean, as Jason notes there, you start with this, you know, stimulus aggregate demand effect. One thing you would normally think you would worry about is that, you know, you do all this borrowing at a time when the economy is pretty strong and you would get crowd out. You would push interest rates up. You would crowd out private investment. I don't think that's a story we can really tell right now. I mean, three is not that high on the 10-year. So I guess the question as we think about, you know, a lot of these provisions only work really well if they can be made permanent. The, these deficits look like they can't be sustained forever, and that might qu call into question the permanence. I guess the question is, are, are they really unsustainable and over, over what period? Because it seems to look like the government's capacity to borrow without obvious short-term negative effects on the economy <laughs> appears to continue, at least for now. Um, okay, so let me start with the tax piece and then move into the fiscal piece. But mm -hmm. I think when you think about the tax bill, the good news on it comes when you look at it in compartmentalized ways. There are pieces of it that are big improvements. But if you look at the interplay between tax reform, economic growth, and fiscal sustainability, um, this was certainly a lost opportunity and probably uh, overall not going to be very good um, in, the, in the long run if you put 10 years as the long run time period. So I think there's a lot of confusion on the numbers. Certainly when the whole tax reform debate was going on, it gets really confusing because when you look at growth, the growth that we're going to see over one to two years is going to be much better than the growth that you're going to see over 10 years. And there was a lot of talk about how much you would need for tax reform to actually pay for itself. So in order for tax reform to pay for itself, we would have need to increase the annual growth rate of GDP by 0.6%. 0.4% if you don't count a bunch of tax extensions, but 0.6% would have paid for $1.5 trillion. If you uh, want to get up to the 3%, that seems to be assumed in a lot of budgets, that's going to have to increase growth from 2.9 to 3. That's 1.1%. And I think the goal of how we develop a comprehensive economic growth plan in this country is really important. Because the reason that our growth is not going to be as high going forward as it was before is because we're aging. And we, do, we have, do not have a plan for productive aging in this country. And the labor force contributions to growth are going to be much smaller than they've been in the past. And we have to compensate for that. Tax reform was a good opportunity to do that. But the growth effects that you get from tax reform, if it doesn't add to the debt, 
are higher because tax reform will um, grow the economy, but the higher levels of debt will undermine growth. And so that's why we've seen that these 10-year estimates, overall, there's, there's that one negative one, the IMF is negative. The other are positive, but they're very limited from basically about 0% growth to 0.06% increase a year. That's compared to the 0.6 we needed, 0.06. So this falls incredibly short. And there were a lot of revenue neutral tax reform plans ideas out there. Um, and I will say that the reason that this tax reform bill isn't what it should be, I don't think we want to turn this into a political panel, but it's because our political system right now is really unwilling to make any hard choices. And we knew how to do revenue neutral tax reform, but in the end people said we can't make these hard choices, we have to have one or two or three trillion dollars that we can borrow to make it easier to get done. Um, what that means is that you have created a huge amount of uncertainty. The whole purpose of tax reform is to create more certainty for businesses so they can make investments. And the one thing we know right now is that uh, within a, uh, starting in a year, we're going to have trillion dollar deficits going on forever. We know that interest payments in the federal budget are going to triple over the next decade. Uh, we know that debt relative to the economy, the debt held by the public, is going to probably be about 100% at the end of 10 years. So this means something else will have to happen. The uncertainty that's created by this is actually a huge problem. It probably creates more uncertainty than we had before tax reform. I'd also, one thing I would also say is there's another big lost opportunity in doing the hard part of tax reform, which is presumably broadening the tax base so that you can bring down tax rates. There are so many tax expenditures. There's still over a trillion a year in the tax code, even after tax reform. There are so many that de-level the playing field, that getting rid of a lot of those tax breaks would have contributed more to economic growth as well. So you could do pro-growth from lowering rates and broadening the base, but we only did the easy part of lowering rates. So I think in the, in the really strong need to help come up with a comprehensive plan to grow the economy, but unfortunately, I know 3% doesn't sound that huge, but 3% is probably, given demographics, out of reach for a 10-year period. Uh, we could have done more on tax reform and we could have done it in a way that would be more sustainable and add more confidence that things weren't going to change. The uncertainty, I think, is, is a problem. Uh, one final thing is that um, I do expect you're going to see pretty high growth for the next one to two years. And I think what you're going to hear is a lot of people saying, see, we hit 3%, no problem. We knew tax reform was going to get us 3% growth. That will be true in the short run because if you throw a whole lot of money into the economy when it's doing well at a period in the business cycle where you normally wouldn't, sure, you're going to see short-term growth. The question is what happens when that sugar high bursts and how it plays out. So, Eric, how do you how do you square that circle? I mean, you know, we have this Republican Congress right now that moved this tax bill that also moved a very large spending bill that the president said that he, you know, didn't want to sign, but then he did. Um, that did not repeal the Affordable Care Act um, and that has not moved on significant changes to Social Security or Medicare. So I guess the idea is if, if the goal is to make this permanent, and, the, and I assume you agree that you, know, you only get the really good economic story if you, if you make it permanent, how, what is the plan to make those numbers add up? Well, I mean, so I, I go back to sort of where we are today um, and what that means for business expansion going forward versus mm -hmm. where we may have been a couple years ago. And clearly, as soon as the election occurred, and I think many of us in this room back 2016, November, would not have suggested that the election turned out the way it did, but we also saw uh, an extreme upshot in terms of optimism. And, and remember that this tax bill sort of uh, transpired in a context of what I call an administration that decidedly was not an opponent or an adversary to business. Uh, and I know that we've had discussions, several of us on this panel before, about the attitude towards risk taking, the attitude towards what business should or shouldn't do in the prior administration versus this one. And I think clearly the, the, the scales would weigh in favor that this administration is, if not a partner, it's certainly not an adversary. Uh, to the conduct of business and risk taking. So that's number one in the context when you say, how do you square the circle here? So, so, so you think the sort of animal spirits thing can, can add so, a well, significant I'm, I'm amount just saying on GDP? That, you know, we've had, if, uh, again, the prior eight years, sub 2% growth. We know you can, to, to Maya's point, we know you can't fix the fiscal situation with just growth alone. We know you can't fix the fiscal situation with cuts alone that we at least got to get back on track, give us some growth, 
let the Congress have some room, if you will, some fiscal room to try and finally do the difficult things that must be done. Uh, and when I say that, we all know the demographics of this country, what it means about the entitlements, especially health care entitlements, Medicare, uh, the difficult votes that those are. But bottom line is you got to do something with that. And historically, if you look at when Congress and Washington acted to try and address fiscal issues that were difficult, let's go back to Reagan in 83 when things uh, in the Social Security system were on the precipice. Congress did act, but you also had GDP at an over 4% growth rate at the time. Uh, if you go back to 96, when the Congress actually enacted, well, uh, when wealth, welfare reform was enacted, those two were relatively good times economically. So if we're going to have a shot to try and see Washington do what it's got to do, much better that we do this um, in, in an environment where things are looking more positively in terms of economic growth. And so that's where I come down. No, I, I mean, I, I can align myself with any of the comments that have been made. This is not the sole answer to trying to address uncertainty going forward. You've still got this overhang of fiscal bomb there out in the future. But at least we're back on track to hopefully be getting some growth re-injected so maybe policymakers, leaders, politicians will have the gumption to do what needs to be done on the spending side. And I mean, I think, you know, I think it's sort of strange to point to entitlements as the problem when the IMF just came out with their report, as they do twice a year, and the United States has the largest deficit of any of the advanced economies measured relative to our GDP. It is the only advanced economy that is expected to see its debt rise as a share of GDP over the next five years. And neither of those facts are because the United States has huge out of control entitlements and they in Europe don't you know, have pensions and health care and unemployment and disability and all of that stuff. That difference, the reason that we're in a different position today um, is because of a set of things of which the tax cuts is a non-trivial part of that difference. And I, now, think, I, think, I, I think I would differ just because we all know, and I don't think you disagree with the fact that disproportionately the cause of annual deficits and their growth and the growth in the debt is health care entitlements. Oh, I was going to get to where we don't disagree, um, but I want to start <laughs> with where we disagreed uh, before I got there. We used to spend a lot of time in rooms together talking about <laughs> fiscal issues. Um, and, uh, and it was actually really, honestly, really, really great conversations, um, and I thought, I, I, I still regret that, that we had never reached a deal um, with, with you. But where we are today, in the year 2017, in the year 20, I guess we're in the year 2018 now, <laughs> yes. um, in the year 2018, you're unreliable with numbers. Um, if you compare our deficits across countries, that difference is not due to entitlement. If you then look forward, absolutely, entitlements are going to compound the problem and make it worse. That's not a reason to say, oh, we have such a difficult task ahead of us. Let's start by going you know, 10 miles in the opposite direction and make it even harder. That's a reason to get started now. So I think that entitlements is not an argument to say, tax cuts are so trivial, who cares? It's an argument to say, wow, with the entitlement thing ahead of us, it's even more irresponsible to cut taxes by 1% of GDP, which is about what this is. I think the problem with the fiscal, though, is my model is not primarily one of fiscal crisis. I think there's always a chance of that. But I think for the United States, which borrows in its own currency, prints its own currency, and has a huge economy, the odds of that are reasonably low. I think there's a little bit of it constrains your ability to deal with unexpected in the future, and that's a problem. But I don't think it's a huge constraint on that. I think the problem is one that economists in the past have called term rates in the woodwork. Um, if you use the standard macro papers to quantify the impact of this on interest rates, you get numbers like 15 to 20 basis points higher. You're not going to see that in some huge way, but we're going to be poorer because of that 10 years from now, and the capital accumulation bill wants, you know, correctly notes we need so much, at, you know, with the interest rates 20 basis points higher, you just undid um, some of what you did um, with the lower tax rates and increase also the amount of foreign borrowing. So even if our GDP goes up, 
our national income doesn't go up as much because we have to use more of our economy um, to repay. So I think that's the problem with the deficit. It's a big problem right now. We just compounded it with this at precisely the time we should have been making progress. And I don't think it will cause a fiscal crisis, which means I don't think it'll force us to solve it. Um, but I think we should solve it, and it would be better if we did. Can I add one sure. quick layer onto that? Because um, many of you probably saw these dueling op-eds, which were really interesting. Jason was one of the authors of the Democratic one, and there was a Republican one. And the Republican one seemed to say uh, the tax cuts really weren't the problem, but now there's going to be a big fiscal problem, and we need to make changes. And the Democratic one was framed in a way that a lot of people saw it, saying entitlements aren't really the problem. That there is an obvious sort of truth with all of these pieces, which is entitlements are the biggest part of the problem going forward. The spending growth, I think it's 81% of spending growth over the next 10 years comes from health, retirement, and interest payments. That has always been the case. The tax cuts made that maybe significantly pretty, a, a good amount worse, and it certainly was silly to go in the wrong direction instead of the right direction. But I think one other piece of it is there was an understanding that you're going to have to get, to get this fixed, have more revenues, and have a reform of entitlement programs. And the fact that the first step was cutting taxes kind of has created ill will, where now all the Democrats who were at a, for a while willing to do entitlement reform has said, no way, I'm not coming to the table. And that's what I don't know how we're going to fix, how we're going to get post-tax cut people to come back to the table and acknowledge that you are going to need higher level of revenues than we have, if for no other reasons, because we've seen nobody's willing to cut any spending. No entitlement reforms have been discussed, and we just had a big budget spending increase of a bill. And so the political economy problem here is real, that the tax cuts made entitlement reform much more difficult. I think one of the things to also remember is that the share of discretionary spending uh, for government as a share of GDP has been declining, and it's been declining to very small levels now. So much of the, the spending by the government is mandatory. In order, so in order to change that spending, you have to have legislation passed to change those, and, and entitlements are a big part of it. Getting back to the story of growth again, uh, and, and, and again, many of the fears of the deficit is because we don't have enough growth. And Mai is absolutely correct to point out, as we age and as the, the population growth starts to slow down in this country, we're down to maybe half a percent or one percent growth that's from the growth of the labor force. So that means that we really need productivity to boost it, to be boosted right. tremendously. And historically, it's very unusual to get 2% plus productivity growth. But we did have that in the past. And that's why I go back to the picture I had, which is the key to success in the future is boosting productivity growth. And boosting productivity growth means having more technological progress that is enhancing of labor. And, and to do that, I think one of the, the, the things that we need to do is shift the perspective of managers in corporates. Um, Jason mentioned that, and, and which is by way of, of, of disincentivizing the use of debt that puts them into a short-termism, into a more long-term perspective as, as, as equity holders. What Jason said earlier about how small these estimates are for the boost in GDP, and most of the mechanisms by which the tax cut increases GDP is what, and again, jargon alert, cost of capital, right? It reduces the cost of capital. Well, you know, if you, you know, having done a lot of investment equations in my life, one of the smallest contributions to boosting investment comes from the cost of capital. Uh, in other words, and, and especially now in this environment where we have so much liquidity in the world, there's no company out there in the last five years who said, I couldn't do an investment project because I didn't have the money. There's money all over. There's a surplus of savings, a savings glut around the world. What the other piece of the investment equation that has always been the massive boost to investment is what's known as the accelerator. When, when firms see that growth is on the horizon and they start to see stuff flying out the door, they say, wow, I don't have enough capacity to meet that demand. I better start expanding capacity now. So growth really is the key to investment, not the cost of capital. So, so how do we get the growth is, is really the question. And, and, and do we need, can we get these guys to invest if it's only a short-term stimulus? Absolutely not, because I'm not going to expand capacity just to meet demands that have increased for six months. So you have to have confidence that the environment will be investment friendly for a long time to come. And the third thing to remember is the fear of the deficit trillion dollar deficits, or as most economists would put it, you're moving from a 3% deficit as a share of GDP to 5%, and the debt as a share of GDP is going well over 100%. What the hell does that mean? What does that mean? I mean, these are great numbers to throw around. These are massive numbers to throw around. But when you ask yourself, do the financial markets care? Because the, the key to the fear is because of the word crowding out. The government crowds out 
private investment. But right now, because we're so flush with liquidity and likely to be flush with liquidity uh, for, for, for quite some time to come into the medium term, that crowding out is not going to happen for quite a while. E I would easily predict into the next five years. Number two, if the markets were concerned about crowding out, we would start to see interest rates rise. Look at what happened with Italy, right? I mean, that's the situation where government really is out of control, debt to GDP really is out of control, and immediately the markets reacted when we didn't get a deal with the IMF and there was some fear that the, the euro area would fall apart. The bond market vigilantes were right there and priced accordingly. What's happened to U.S. 10-year rates? They barely have a three-handle now. And, and part of that is because there's a fear of inflation going on. The real rate of interest, right, if you take into account inflation, still hangs around half a percent. And so cost of capital limiting crowd, uh, and crowding out fears, that's not for a long time to come. So the key is, can we sustain enough positive enthusiasm on the part of businesses to say, I'm willing to put some money in to expanding capacity, improving my workforce uh, skills, in, in, increasing the amount of intangible investments I've got to get myself ready for and, and put in place technologies of the future to compete with the Chinese, to compete with the emerging market economies that are going to be eating my lunch unless I get my act together. Because right now, the digitization of China would overwhelm what's going on here. The fastest internet in the world is available in Asia. Right? Anybody who travels to Asia comes back here and say, my God, this cell phone is slow. So, so those are the things that I'd be wary about, is the businesses falling behind that technology race because of, of underinvestment, and it's not because of cost of capital. So can I, I, can I add right. two quick but, deficit fears as well, sure. in addition to that? The first one is growing interest payments as part of the budget. So right now in the federal budget, single fastest growing thing is not health care, it's interest. It's interest payments. So that, whether you're conservative, whether you're progressive, whatever you want, that's not the best part to have of your budget uh, growing so quickly. And the second thing is the fiscal space for if and when we have the next recession. So when we went into the last downturn, our debt relative to the economy was below 40%. It was 30% of GDP. This time, it's going to be twice that high. It's going to be approaching 80% of GDP. So the fiscal flexibility that we have lost uh, when opportunities or crises come along um, can have a real cost. So there are other things than the crowding so, out. So and let me just also briefly, I mean, I, as I said, you know, I think you know, if you think the effect is 20 basis points, you're not going to see a huge spike. But guess what? We're going to have less capital um, 10 years from now. And we're also going to have, we should care about not our GDP. We should actually care about our GNP, how much we as a country earn. And if the way you get your GDP is a lot of borrowing and you have to repay it, um, you end up yeah. worse off. So that would be the first thing I'd say. Second, I'd be happy to have a debate later about accelerator model versus cost of capital. Um, once you're in the accelerator model world, that says the way to boost business investment, you could have done it with more infrastructure. Because more infrastructure would boost GDP growth. GDP growth would give businesses more of a reason to invest. You don't even need to use the whole corporate lever. So once you're in that model, you want to leave the business tax reform entirely, the only reason to do that is cost of capital. I think there's been a theme here, which is that, you know, it, we're not about to be faced with a crisis where we have to fix any of these things, that we're likely to see pretty good growth numbers for a couple of years, that we're, you know, we're going to see only modest increases in interest rates, not, not really sharp increases. And so at the same time, you have the president musing about sort of a phase two of the tax bill. So it might be that the next time Congress takes this up, it will be not because they had to, but because they wanted to. And so I, th then my question is, what, what's the right thing to do there? Because, um, you know, the, I mean, to, to Jason's point, Jason notes that there are some provisions in this bill that increase effective tax rates on certain things. Obviously, no tax bill is what anybody exactly wanted. It's a process of legislative negotiation. Are there, are there tweaks to be made to this, Eric, to try to so, make man, it work better? I, I think, you know, listen to the conversation. We've gotten very theoretical and very macro. And, and I, I get back to, you know. We can do the, more if you want. Uh, right. I'm sure you can. <laughs> yeah. but, 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 but I think that what is driving sort of policy, and at some point what Bill talked about is, where policymakers, and in, in my experience, having been in Washington for 14 years and, and now in the private sector, what they're looking for um, is something to sort of shoot to, and this is competitiveness. This is about how do we make the United States more competitive, and we've not in any of this discussion did we note how much this bill did to attract capital to the United States, to attract businesses, finally, to go and consider again in terms of its cost 
what it's like to, to locate here and to invest here. Uh, and set aside all the Twitter and all the other rhetoric. The bottom line is this bill moves us closer towards being more competitive towards that big goal, which is how are we going to go and take on um, this big competitor, this sometimes adversary in this country called China. Uh, and that's what I think will more likely galvanize, and if we can ever get and condition the environment for policymakers to do the kinds of things to create more certainty long term, um, that's what we'll need to do. So when you ask, look, are we going to have, are we going to see them go in and tweak the tax code some more? You know, you, you just, I mean, who, who knows? They can't do it this year. You know that, right? So what, what, is, what is likely? Are they going to go and tweak to, to put more certainty back in? Can they preserve the expensing provisions? Are they still going to be working? These are all the kinds of things. One of the, one of the um, pieces that did not make the bill is individual rates. You know, a true conservative believes that, you know, the marginal benefit towards decreasing individual rates is going to spur more, more work, more productivity on the part of individuals. That was not really a part of this bill. So will Congress go look at that? We'll see. But again, it's, uh, further reductions in individual income tax rates. We, 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 in individual rates, because again, this, is, this was really so lopsided in terms of um, uh, providing the real shot in the arm to businesses to go start hiring and investing again, which is, you know, from my perspective, a very worthy thing. But they didn't really, um, if you look at a lot of the, um, the commentary and, and the proposals that led up to last year's tax bill, a lot of those proposals had individual rate reductions, which were not very uh, uh, significant comparatively to the corporate rate reduction. Bill, are you seeing the, the shift in, in international investment that Eric is talking about? I, I think what we do see is because of our current account deficit, a lot of capital is flowing into the country. Because we have highest rates of return in the world right now still, there's a lot of capital coming in. So for sure, there is a lot of foreign investment coming in. And the fear of, 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 of saying that, well, our GNP is floating out the door because with all this capital coming, we've got to pay these guys off, right? Well, I think one of the things that we have to consider is if they create a lot of jobs here, our, 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 our wage income and our productivity gets enhanced. So I have no problem paying off some debt to foreigners if I can have more jobs here and I have more productive jobs here. So, so I think that is, is sort of a misnomer of, oh my God, we're going to be paying uh, abroad all of our profits. Yeah, but you have the same GDP without having to repay them, and you do even better, Bill. But, so, but we want to use I mean, the foreign you, you capital because we don't need, save enough. You didn't need all the foreign borrowing. Yes, we do, because we, the, the a lot household, of it is financing. I mean, we have the, the household we have the lowest, savings rate is 2.5%, right, exactly. going up to 3% because right. of the tax cut. Right. Come on, we don't save enough. The right, Americans exactly. like to consume. Right, exactly. So we need the foreign that capital to do the investment. Or we need to do less just saving at the federal level. <laughs> um, Let's see. I think it's time to take. Uh, we can take some questions from the floor, actually. Uh, right here in the front. So wouldn't the increase oh, sorry. Wait. If you could wait for the microphone. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Where's the first one? Right here. Uh, wouldn't a big increase in immigration solve a lot of the problems that you're talking about? First, the, I mean, I don't think our biggest problem is the deficit. Sorry, Maya. Um, mm. But it is notable, by the way, that CBO is projecting 3.3 percent growth this year. They're projecting really high growth next year, and that still has us getting to the trillion dollar deficit. So even with growth rates that I think are probably higher than we're going to end up seeing they have this deficit, if you're talking about our underlying um, economic problems, I think immigration is the single biggest lever we have for economic growth, both because it increases the size of the workforce. In fact, without immigration, our workforce would be falling, not rising, would be going the direction of Japan. Um, but also brings with it um, a lot of our productivity growth, innovation, and dynamism um, comes from immigrants. So I think you get productivity growth, you get labor. It's both parts of the equation, and it's bigger than anything else we could do for the economy. What do you, Maya? When you think about it, does it matter to you? Because I mean, it increases GDP growth, but it decreases per capita GDP growth. I'm no, no, the productivity means the per capita goes per up. Per capita too. goes up. So your your labor force is growing. But also your productivity, you're getting more output. Per I thought worker. the estimates show that it actually decreases per capita GDP growth. Uh, no. uh, it mm. Doesn't that depend on who's immigrating? It, the CBO had something of wages went down mm -hmm. before they went up. Their wages included the wages of the new native workers who came here along with the existing people who are here. I think that oh, might you'd be want what to take you were out. thinking okay. about um, with, with, what, with what they said. 
But regardless, I mean, in a world where we have pay, where we're going to have pay-as-you-go, um, social security and, and systems like that, getting people working age and getting their money in today and not having to pay them till later helps us as well with those programs. You pay so. Uh, yes, this, this guy right here. Don't you think a lot of the problems could be solved if the government could just spend less money? Just freeze the budget for two years, even. Well, you know, but never mind longer than that. But but spend less money on what? Then right. is the question. So it, right, if 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 you if you begin to do that, you're talking across the board, uh, mandatory and discretionary. You're talking some significant political pain. I mean, so a nice suggestion, a nice suggestion, uh, right? A nice suggestion. I'm just saying, just the practicality and the likelihood of that happening, not so much. So I, I find it interesting, actually, uh, if you go back and look at the 1992 presidential debates, you have all these conversations about interest rates that are very, very high in, in the national conversation and basically about how the government running large budget deficits is causing everybody's mortgage to be more expensive, it's making it more difficult for businesses to expand. And this created, I think, a lot of political energy both for two tax increase packages and for some significant uh, spending reduction packages. And so I guess the question is, it, uh, I, I mean, I don't think we're going to see a, a spending freeze like that, but is, how can you have energy for significant spending restraint without that economic situation, which it feels like we haven't had so, for 20 years? So again, I, I went back and yeah. talked about you know, the, the other two instances of entitlement reform and, mm -hmm. and actually reducing spending, because again, disproportionately, the spending's on the mandatory side. Um, and you, you had relatively good economic times with growth occurring, but you also had some immediacy in terms of the Social Security program back in the 80s at the precipice. Um, but I think the point that you're making about the 92 debates, and I don't recall them, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it, the problem all of a sudden became personal and real. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the problems that I know that we had when I was on the Hill, and I think it culminated in the Romney-Ryan ticket, when um, the Republican Party was almost about delivering, you know, uh, graduate school macroeconomic classes uh, on the campaign trail, because they were trying to talk about sort of the unfunded man, the unfunded uh, uh, deficits uh, in, in terms of the entitlement programs, the the disproportionate amount that the spending is of, of government spending, GDP. We were getting to such technicalities. And nobody, I always said, nobody, if you think about the single mom waking up in the morning in L.A. County sh and she's got to deal with her kids in the morning, there's no way she could connect the fiscal problem with her everyday life. Now, if all of a sudden her mortgage popped up and the interest rate on a variable rate instrument popped up and all of a sudden that meant something to her, yes, it is an impetus to try and react. But, you know, who wants to bring that on no. in order to solve that problem? I mean, so. And, and so, I mean, what we've seen is that recently only the only decisions that get made are the result of an action-forcing moment. Um, and that means avoiding a government shutdown, avoiding a default, some really bad things. In 1983, it was because the Social Security Trust Funds were about to not be able to pay benefits. We're way off on that. And the big goal is... Could we actually make the right kind of decisions in advance of when some near crisis forces us to? And the answer is no, we cannot. <laughs> so then you get to, are there kind of budget constraints that you can put into place? And that's what you're saying. Could you just freeze spending? There's a joint select committee on budget process going on this year. It sounds super boring, but maybe they would actually come up with some kind of ideas of budget constraints but, that you put in place. But if you look back but at... We just had a sequester right. that we just busted through. Both sides exactly. signed on to it. 2011. We spent so much... That was it. The right. spending right. increases we just put in are probably as big as the tax increases if you extend them. So even budget constraints don't seem strong enough to kind of control the fiscal free-for-all mentality that we're in with this polarized Washington where everyone wants to give things away. But so isn't, but, but why did we bust through the sequester? We did it because pe there were, you know, the, it's not just numbers, right? These are government programs that people felt like there were important needs that were not getting met because there had been this, you know, this extreme, uh, the, this, this ex extreme, you know, ultimately reduction as a share of the economy in terms of discretionary spending. And similarly with entitlement programs, I mean, these are, these are also not just numbers on the page. These are, well, this is income that people re rely on in, in, in retirement. And so I guess the, the thing about getting people to think about these trade-offs is that, the, that there are trade-offs on the other side, and that's the... Th that's and well, it's not just things people... Yeah. Rely oh, sorry. Well, yeah. it's just, if you don't force something to be paid for, yeah. then you never think about that trade-off. One of the beauties of actually paying for something, either on the spending side or the tax cut side, is just that basic question of, is it worth it? But if you're going to mm -hmm. deficit finance it, everything's worth it, unless you're our kids, where it's... 
not worth it. Right. And I, and I agree with Maya on that. And we did three deals on sequester relief in our administration. Yeah. And all of them we fully pretended to pay for right. them. We could, <laughs> we could argue That's over exactly the magnitude. Right. But there was quite a lot paid for. And at least there was the, the idea that you should be paying for it. I do think on, you know, to get back to, to where you started us, you know, where the United States looks very different from other countries is our taxes, a share of GDP, are way lower than most of the rest of the OECD. We could go to the Bull Simpson number, which was 21% of GDP, do that together with entitlements, which they had in Bull Simpson too, be on a much more sustainable debt path, and we would still have taxes at the 25th percentile um, of the OECD. So I think we need to raise money to pay for the stuff that, that we seem to want to do. And that would be, we're, what, around 17 right now, right? 17. Yeah, so that would, that would be an yeah. enormous tax increase. That would be increase. a huge tax increase. Yeah. Um, There's no political will for that. Nope. Uh, uh, Steve, in the back. Um, so maybe to try to sort of sum this up or bring it together or something. Um, <laughs> Come have a seat. <laughs> well, no, I, I wasn't trying to end it either because it's a really great discussion actually. But as, as I understand it at the moment, if you take sort of the conventional wisdom forecast, whether it's the IMF that Jason referred to, which is slightly negative, whether you look at Goldman Sachs or the Joint Committee on Taxation or all the independent forecasters are looking at this kind of 0.04 percent plus or minus increase in GDP as a result of this tax bill over the next 10 years, which then gets you to these trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see, gets you to $20 trillion of debt at the end of it. And I assume to the points that Eric Kanner and Bill Lee have made that these forecasters have incorporated into their models whatever they think the benefits of this tax bill are, whether it's changing our competitive position, whether it's attracting new investment, whatever it is they think is going to happen, they presumably put in their model and they've come out in this place with these massive deficits. And I think if you take Jason's point, which is a very interesting point that I hadn't thought about, that macroeconomic models would tell you that we're not going to have an aha moment where the credit markets suddenly wake up and roll over and say, this is terrible, it's the end of the world. Then if that doesn't happen, then 20 years from now, we're going to have $20 trillion of debt that somebody's going to have to pay for. So I guess my question may be a bit more for Eric or Bill or others is, am I missing anything or is that essentially what we have in front of us unless we take some of these other policy actions that people are talking about. I, I think from a technical perspective, um, the model builders have put in their best guess for what the supply side effects would be, yes. But we don't know what the supply side effects are because we don't have a good model, a good framework to gauge the stuff. So a lot of the stuff about productivity enhancing uh, investments that I'm talking about, in some sense is a hope and a prayer. Um, because we don't have these models on the supply side that are as well developed as the demand side, which is why you know the, the, the standard macro models are showing very small effects, and ultimately they get to a capacity constraint because the capacity constraint only rises with exogenous productivity growth and, and, and labor force growth. So we don't have really a fully articulated model that can really show us what the possibilities are. So, so it's really in the judgment of the model builder how to put in these, these, uh, these more positive effects. And, and, and number two, I would say, um, in terms of the, the fiscal impact on the capital markets, the one thing that you know um, uh, that, that's true about uh, investors out there, global investors, is that they're on the scent for any whiff of disaster because a lot of money can be made in defaults, a lot of money can be made in being on the right side of where the rate increases are going to be. And, and, and until, um, at least as of today, I don't see anyone worrying about crowding out and about, about somehow are not being able to pay and finance these deficits. What I, I hear worries about is, is the, is the capacity limit going to be rising fast enough to avoid inflation? And, and I think the, the issue right now is there is no real inflation on the horizon. Uh, and, and unless you're a real true Phillips curve believer that 3% unemployment uh, would, would get you uh, a, a massive burst in, in inflation, it, it, that's, that's, there's no sign of that in, in either the Federal Reserve's mind or anybody else's mind. I think the concern for the, the, the downfall is, are these models incorrect and what have we left out and how do we best put it in? And that's something the profession really is still out to see about. Yeah, I, mean, I just add just a, just, just a general sense of, of what, what do you expect? I mean, if, if, if your comment is correct and basically we assume everything that's out there now is true and we end up at point, you know, X, Y, Z in the future, I, I, just, I just hesitate to be able to assume that, again, not only what Bill said and about all the unknowns in the modeling, but 
you never know what will intervene. And, and I go back to sort of this very macro situation in terms of geopolitics, in terms of what's driving um, the actual electoral and political situation in our country, which is much to do about the, the economic rival in China uh, and, and how that relates back to all these sort of uh, uh, micro sort of issues on the ground in, in policymakers' districts and elected office districts. What kind of leadership will come forward to say, hey, we've got to galvanize and take it on? We just don't know those things. I mean, so yes, you're, you're, you could be right if you assume all this, but I just think that there's a, there's a dynamism that in, in the process that some, something hopefully will catch on so we can begin to see some corrective action uh, and, and see policymakers and politicians pushed into, into helping correct the situation that you point out. I mean, but right. but to, anchor, oh. to anchor it in, excuse me, in Steve's point, there were six or eight models and the entire range of them was slightly negative to 0 0.06 with one outlier that was still below the 0 0.4 you needed to pay for itself and that model admittedly by the people who ran it said but we don't account for the negative effects of debt. So within the range it's pretty clear that we're not going to suddenly see growth rates ten times what all the models were expecting. So I think Steve's point is an important one which is every basic model that was out there that showed what the growth was led to a fiscal deterioration which is going to be significant over the coming years. There, there's no model that that right. assumes it will be more optimistic right. than that. Three quick things. I have a lot of uncertainty about what growth is going to be over the next decade. If I got my like one phone a friend thing, I'd ask them is AI going to pay off or are we going to run out of ideas? If I got my <laughs> second phone a friend thing, I'd ask like will China's growth continue or will it crater? If I got my third, if I had like I'd need 10 calls before I got to one where I thought what is the macro impact of the tax cuts? is the main uncertainty we have about growth over the next decade. That is not the main uncertainty we have about growth over the next decade. And that's precisely because the effects just aren't that large. And the people who do 10-year forecasts have in generally kept them about the same or lowered them relative to what they were a year ago. I think those forecasts are terrible and uncertain, but they're taking the best information you have. So that would be point one. My um, second point would be that um, and I'll just leave it at two so we have more time, it is that in terms of budgeting, I would much rather be pleasantly surprised by growth than the opposite. And I can tell you that when the administration forecasts 3% growth over the next decade, their odds of a pleasant surprise are a lot lower than they should be. <laughs> uh, let's, ah, uh, this fellow right here. Thank you. Um, so when we think of like the bond market's reaction, right, and, and the thing I'm sort of uncertain on here is, like you mentioned in the early 90s, there was a reaction, rates went up. Um, we're running these deficits. Japan has got way higher debt than us. There's been no reaction over there. People say it's foreign, it's domestic borrowing, but we have the domestic, we have the reserve currency of the world. So maybe there's no effect. So how do you think of this issue is, how long do the debts go, and does it ever matter, like in Japan's case, or does it not matter? How do we think of this issue? <laughs> I don't know. Do you want us to have the Japanese economy? Is that your model? No, well, I'm just saying that, like, in, like, you could say 10 years from now, we could have way more right. debt, but we could be like Japan, and rates would no. go up. I guess yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm in this, I mean, I'll, I'll re I won't repeat it yet again, but I'm in, and then I will. Um, <laughs> I think these effects are sort of small to medium and grow over time. I don't think they're catastrophic but I don't think they're zero, and I can still worry about them. And, and the fiscal it is pretty loony. I mean, our wait, if you look at when our unemployment rate is below 4.5%, the average deficit is 0 0.1. When our unemployment rate is below 5, the average deficit is 0 0.3. We're at 3.3. I mean, we're at 3 going to 5. I mean, we're in a crazy yeah. position for where we are now in the cycle. Right, but I don't, I don't think the point is that that's a good idea. It's that you can end up in a situation where it's a thing that you can keep doing, right. and then you do. Right. And, that and that's I, what, I guess I'd also yeah. just come back to a quantities perspective rather yeah. than prices. So interest rates are the price that mediates it. Look at quantities. Your savings, investment, the difference between them is the amount of foreign borrowing you need. Larger deficits is less savings, more foreign borrowing. I agree with Bill that our second choice should be foreign borrowing for productive investment in the United States. Our first choice should be if we can figure out how to finance more of that productive investment in the United States without the foreign, with less of the foreign borrowing. That's even better, and that's where I'm more certain. <laughs> we can take one very quick question. Um, right here, Jim. Do, do a quick one. Yeah. 
I think there's a panel here that says living to 100. Uh, what is our chance of a bipartisan, it has to be bipartisan, uh, relook at uh, raising the retirement age for Social Security if we're living that long? No, I mean, listen, the, the are, um, well, back when, when Jason referred to some of the discussions that we were having around 2011 going forward, um, it was very much a part of the discussion. And I do think... Medicare in, age. Uh, Medicare age, right. And then Social Security was out on the fringes. Um, continue to be, but yes, I, there is there's sentiment for it, and then we we can there's a whole other discussion about what uh, what the grand bargain was or wasn't, who defined it, and and who believed in in ex, in, in what and what it was on either side. But I, I think that there is again, it's about leadership. I mean, the toxicity in Washington right now is at a premium. I'm not sure we're going to get that done now. I mean, in fact, the president who obviously has been known to change his mind publicly, um, has said that, that, we're, that they weren't going to touch entitlements right now. So um, short term, no. But uh, there's, a, there's a fairly well-recognized necessity for that to happen. I think Maya's point is relevant here, which is basically that, you know, in that sort of situation, no one can get everything they want, and Democrats will not react well to Republicans seeming to have gotten everything they want and then asking Democrats uh, to But I, you know what, and I wanted to respond to that. I mean, I, I agree in the current cycle we're in, but things have a habit of changing significantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this midterm, given the number of retirements, you will have a new, uh, a, a new formula with a new cycle of reelect nationally that could mm -hmm. provide some impetus for Maya and her great work that she's trying to do. So. And you I was going to say that raising a retirement age <laughs> is a no-brainer. <laughs> and it seems like right now we are intent on not doing any of the no-brainers, but Eric has just given me a little bit of cause for hope, which is the pendulum does keep swinging back and forth. And so maybe, maybe uh, what we can look at, the happy spin on both the tax cut that wasn't paid for and busting the budget with the spending bill is that we were just increasing how quickly we got to hit rock bottom and as soon as we hit rock bottom the pendulum will turn around and we will work on a mini or a grand bargain in the near future well that is a that is a optimistic there note on, on which we can end the panel thank you everybody yeah, thank you.